Our speaker today is Dr. John Hanna, serves as Research Professor of Theological Studies, Distinguished Professor of Historical Theology, and Acting Chair of the Department of Theological Studies. He has served at DTS for 40 years. He's a frequent and popular church and conference speaker, both home and abroad. His teaching interests include the general history of the Christian church, but with particular interest in the works of Jonathan Edwards and John Owen. He has publications, which are many, include books, journals, chapters and books, audio material, and computerized works. He recently published a history of Dallas Theological Seminary. He stays active in both his church and serves on boards of other Christian organizations. He's married to his wife, Carolyn, and they have two married daughters and six grandchildren. And Barbie and I have had the privilege of traveling with John and Carolyn uh, uh, in many places around the world on Reformation tours, and we're looking forward to a trip on the East Coast even this fall to understand more of what God has done in his church here in America. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. John Hanna? Thank you, man. Good Good time. Thank you. Um, and Scott, wherever you are, congratulations. Couldn't go to a better guy. My topic, obviously, today is um, the heritage of our institution. Uh, the title of my message is Our Past, Shaped by a Passion, Based on an Insight, and Propelled by Sacrifice. Significant consequences emerge from small beginnings, often in obscure settings, by unlikely people placed in a particular setting at the vortex or concatenation of circumstances that only causes a providentialist in retrospect to find its sources in factors that transcend cultural and social conditions. That is, to the almighty hand of God, of an altogether divine and majestic being who works all things according to his own purposes and glory, social and cultural conditioning being merely the outward concurrent circuitous concophonies, reasons and causes not being synonymous, and that is all. All of this while others seek warranted credulity in the almighty power of chance, contingency, and human ingenuity. Secular scholars in many fields have long debated the nature of causation and have produced an impressive array of collaborative evidence to support their insights. Educators have assumed the task of translating their findings into the classroom and through their hearers to the general public. While not denigrating social, cultural, and personal factors in causation, providentialists, and among whom I am but one, argue for our biases, from our biases, that such factors are only the important, necessary, and celebrated circumstances through which the God of the universe, the giver of our Lord Jesus Christ in the great incarnation, has chosen to bring about his divine will on the stage of time, only to inaugurate his divine redemptive purpose secured securely and without contingency at Calvary, where defeat was turned to triumph in the resurrection three days later, with which all humanity will concur and experience in varying degrees for eternity. Today, I want to look with you at one happening in history the founding and perpetuation of one institution, Dallas Theological Seminary. While I confess that the hand of God is not only the invisible cause of our existence, it is the sustaining mercies of the great being that has brought it to this day, the beginning of its 69th year of existence as a professional graduate level religious institution. Without doubt, the cause of our continuance is the benevolence and gracious mercy of the triune and majestic God of the universe. However, 
And with all that duly and properly stated at the beginning, I want to spend a few moments speaking to the issue of human factors and passions that created and has sustained our school for nearly nine decades. My thesis is easy to state, and it is this. Dallas Theological Seminary was born in the passionate dream of a single visionary. It was predicated on a clear assumption, and it has been perpetuated for several decades by enormous sacrifice. It is about a vision. It is about an assumption. It is about sacrifice. To reflect on these three factors, I am limited by time, and more by my, by my own limited knowledge and understanding. But I will make a few comments. Dallas Seminary is about a vision that we are highly committed to. It is about an assumption that motivates that vision. And based upon that assumption that motivates that vision, it has come and will come and does come from enormous sacrifice of faceless people. First, what is our vision? The vision is that of an altogether beautiful Savior whom God had sent to address humanity's deepest need. It's about a person. The vision of that was that of passion for the lostness of mankind born of the experience of redeeming mercies and its stellar remediation through the atoning sacrifice of God's gift from heaven, the Son of God, the Son of Man. An understanding of that grace through mercy has been extended to mankind. A purchase made by one so perfect and complete that God's wrath has been assuaged forever, permitting God within the limit, limitations of his own character to, justif to justly extend to all mankind salvation without cause or the demand of human endeavor, a free and forever forgiveness for the simple and unmerited act of recognition and acquiescence to the beauty of the person and provision of an altogether bountiful and glorious Savior. It was born in and out of the redemptive experience of Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder and first president of our institution. This is Dr. Chafer, born under the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant in uh, Rock Creek, Ohio. This is his birth home. His father uh, was educated at Auburn Theological Seminary and became an ordained uh, congregational pastor and appointed home missionary and church planter. Uh, Lewis Berry Chafer grew up in that kind of a home. His dad was a church planter south of Wichita, Kansas for two years um, in Wellington, Kansas, where he planted various churches. And during that time, back in Ohio, uh, a third son, a second son, was, was to come into that family. Uh, about the age of seven or eight, likely in Smithfield, Pennsylvania, where his father was pastoring in the mountains with the hope that a creeping yet fatal disease called tuberculosis could be assuaged. 
he led his son to the experience of the redemption that is only found in the Savior. And as a little lad, he understood, and his mother wrote in his Bible the words that captured him forever. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, only begotten son, that believing on him, that Lewis Berry Chafer believing on him, might not perish, but have, but have everlasting life. This young man developed in his teenage years, witnessed the death of his father in 1882 of tuberculosis, uh, a, a tragic event for him. His mother became uh, the provider of the home. She was a high school teacher. They returned to Rock Creek, Ohio, where he took his elementary and secondary training. From there, he went to Oberlin Conservatory of Music. He was a uh, musician by family and by training. He spent there a full year and parts of two others not graduating from the conservatory, which was a very high-class institution. The reasons he did not graduate were the, was the poverty of his family and the illness of his brother. He attached himself to an evangelist by the name of Reed. And in the 1880s, late 80s and early 90s, he traveled with Mr. Reed and several others in the work of evangelism as a musician, a singer, uh, a man who set up the tents and cleaned up afterward. Um, in 1898, he married a lady that he had met at Oberlin College, Lorraine Case. And they together formed an evangelistic team. Uh, the heart of Dr. Chafer is the heart of an evangelist who understood the importance of education. In 1900, a life change came to this dear man when, as a ordained congregational pastor in Buffalo, New York, he attended the Moody Conference, or the Northfield Conferences of Moody's origin in Northfield, Massachusetts. There, uh, in those summer conferences, he says that he learned more about the Bible and more about the gospel than he had hitherto learned. Uh, it is in those conferences that uh, prominent men of their day on the stage of oratory pass through. W.H. Griffith Thomas, who will later figure so prominently in the origins of our institution. Uh, probably more importantly was this man. Uh, he sat in one of his classes at Northfield Training School in 1900, the fall, when this man was explaining Romans chapter 6. And uh, Lewis Berry Chafer says that that was the change of his life when he began to understand what later becomes he that is spiritual. He links himself with Schofield. He operates in the New York Training School. He is one of the founders of what becomes the Philadelphia College of Bible. He becomes an itinerant in the South. Um, under the auspices of Mr. Schofield, this is a later um, announcement of Bible conferences that he was in. But the point is, is that he, he asked young men who were in the ministry, uh, what was your training like? He, he gives lectures at Union Seminary, Richmond, Virginia. And he asked them, what's your training like? What's missing? And the guys would say, uh, the Bible is missing. We learn about it, but we don't learn it. And that put a spark in this guy's mind that would take a decade to mature. And in 1924, 
for a concophony of reasons. The Evangelical Theological Seminary is born. It's born out of the passion of this man. So if you were to say to me, what is the passion of Dallas? What are we really all about? My answer is, we are about Jesus Christ. He impresses us deeply. We have been won by affection to the affectionate one. We are committed to this guy. That's our vision. Our vision is to help people to understand his claims because we have experienced them. We have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom that we're learning about. And it drives us like crazy. Well, what's the basic assumption? The basic assumption that undergirded the vision of the redeeming event in Christ is that what the Bible declares is unquestionably true and beyond doubt, debate and doubt. The Bible is unapologetically true and sufficient to explain life, beget life, and sustain life until that time when what it promises about life comes to eternal fruition. We belong to a tradition that recognizes the contribution of natural theology, philosophic rationalism, the role of experience, and the importance of the collective wisdom of those who have gone before us. However, we believe and order our lives on the assumption that the witness of Scripture stands above and beyond all other revocatory sources of knowledge. The Bible is placed in the symbols of our institution, not merely to indicate a continuity with the past, but to declare that we find the Bible and its historically interpretive message, the so-called old, old story, to be as relevant to our generation as when the promise of life was granted to Abraham and his children 4,000 years ago. We want the Bible. We want to be Bible-centered people. Not because we are fearful of the uncertainties of our present age, needing what Marx said was a dulling, intoxicating sedative called religion to hide our cowardice, but because we believe that human nature is as blighted as when our first parents were expulsed from God's presence. And this great book is all we need to resolve the problem of hell, of death, of sin, and divine wrath. When you walk outside Chafer Chapel and look up, you see our seal. We began in 24, incorporated in the state of Texas the following year. But in the middle of that symbol is our great assumption that the dysfunctionalism of mankind, of which there are vying 250 theories of remediation, that book has the answer. And the answer is Christ alone 
in Calvary alone. When you walk into Davidson Hall, soon to be renovated, look up. There's a Bible there. We have a very simple assumption. We love the book because we love the guy in the book. How else would we know him? No one else has come from heaven. We, we just really believe when you look at our architecture that the Bible is really important. We're really committed to it. We can be fancy, but we can be clear as a bell. The passion that drives Dallas Seminary is the gospel. The profound and deeply motivating sense that mankind has a serious problem that cannot be resolved by good intentions, moral resolve, community pressure, or governmental programs and regulations. The problem is that dysfunction, the problem is not that dysfunction is rooted in external forces, some environmental paralysis, the crushing of our ids, aborting the natural development of our egos and our youth by a super ego. But the reason for moral ineptitude is a blighted and twisted set of affections. The tragedy of mankind is amnesia, not caused by blunt force applied to our craniums, but by a voluntary unwillingness to hear the voice of natural theology in the sunset, however shadowed and weak that voice may be, and certainly not of an atoning savior. The root problem for all of us is a spiritual cardiovascular issue that can only be addressed, at least according to our bias, by an inward change that only God and his provisions as described in the Bible can affect. We have a passion and we have a fundamental basis for that passion. However, there's something else Vision, foundational presuppositions alone, has not resulted in the effect that you see today in this happy place. It took and it takes sacrifice. The story of Dallas Seminary is that of a hearty band of men and women now mostly faceless. Board members who have directed the school's future by guarding its integrity. Administrative staff, including presidents, that have given themselves selflessly to our perpetuation. A faculty that has chosen to be here in less than ideal circumstances at times like the Depression of 1930. A staff that may have proven to be more selfless than all of us. And a student body, now in the thousands, that have brought the vision, bought the vision, and carried it to the ends of the earth, as well as countless donors over the decades that believed in what we are attempting to do and gave of their resources, laboring in prayer, that this work could go on. Here are some of the faceless people. Wim M. Anderson, first prof of homiletics here. Ha <laughs> ha, pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Dallas. <laughs> He's a hoot, but we'll skip that. Um, you obviously know by hearing um, uh, John Walford, who came to us in 1936 as a teacher 
and ended his career with us, uh, retired in 1986. Led our school from 1945 to 1952 as VP in Dr. Chafer's de declining health. And then from 1952 to 1986, um, and you heard about him yesterday. Uh, you hear of, um, of Howard Hendricks, who came to us in 1951, and the Lord took him this year from us. These men sacrificed, or Dallas Seminary would not be here. They could have chosen much easier paths, but they love they love the Bible and they love the guy in it and wants the whole world to know about it. Dwight Pentecost. What a hoot. <laughs> Came to us in 1956 and still with us. Huh. Stand to, I could go on and on. These all guys are all hoots. They're my friends at night. Um, <laughs> Stan Toussaint, who just recently retired. One of the best Bible teachers I have ever got to sit under. 1952, at a, we inaugurated our second president, John F. Walvoord. 1986, our second, our third president, I, I don't know about if we were uh, inaugurated Chafer, I think he just walked on the scene. Uh, you know, here I am, suck it up. Uh, uh, we are a very serious people, but we do not take ourselves seriously. We take somebody else seriously. 1986, God gave us Dr. Campbell and led us through some very, very hard economic and social times as an institution. 1994, uh, God gave us uh, Dr. Charles Swindoll to lead us for some years. And then in the year 2000, uh, our current leader, all fine godly men, when I interviewed Dr. Bailey's wife for my book, I said, uh, how would you describe him? Really, at home, not, not here. I'll never forget what she said. She said, um, Mark is the real thing. He's one person. What a wonderful compliment coming from the person you sleep with. This was Dallas Seminary on Hughes Circle in 1924. Rented apartment. 13 students, one renegade. We, he came from Oklahoma. I think he returned. <laughs> uh, light collects flies. We had ours. Um, 13 men who have all gone on to glory. A faculty made up of itinerants. Um, Dr. Chafer to teach theology, Anderson homiletics, um, honorario perpetuo, Hebrew and Greek. In our second year, that little apartment complex near Fair Park became too small. And the seminary was pointed to an old mansion that sat at the corner of Swiss and Apple, built in 1897 by a philanthropist by the name of William Gaston. And that was vacant. Uh, we were able to purchase that building, and that building was able to house our third year class, and then called uh, the Evangelical Theological Seminary. It became Dallas Seminary in 1936. <sighs> Immediately upon arriving there, in 1928, the seminary was able to build its first permanent building, which we call today Davidson. Uh, Davidson was a board member. 
he gave the $80,000 that made this building possible. It was dedicated to his mother, Lydie C. Anderson. We were so impoverished that we wanted to put a plaque in her honor. It's now there. But we realized we didn't have the money to buy the plaque. So we went back to Davidson and asked them for the money. <laughs> <laughs> we are not bashful people. <laughs> Davidson was built. And then the following year, uh, we added a second building, which became a uh, name for Daniel Minor Stearns, whose son was then in the student body, later would become a missionary in Belgium. And that became our campus because depression came and war came. Uh, in 1952, we added our third building, and it became, obviously, a Chafer Chapel. Um, and that year, Dr. Chafer went on to be with the Lord in August. Uh, there was no other additional building in the 60s or in the 50s, but in early 1960, 63, the seminary built what is now known as Mosher Library, named for a board member and donor to our institution from the beginning. Uh, when I arrived at the scene, uh, that's all we had. We had Davidson, Stearns, Chafer, and Mosher Library. The growth years came, obviously, in the 70s and 80s, structurally. Um, and we added uh, uh, two buildings in 72 that are now called uh, Todd and Campbell. Um, we later would add uh, what is called... Uh, the Walbert Student Union in 1982. Then came the, uh, the Hendricks building uh, in the 80s. Uh, in the late 80s, we added uh, to it the Turpin Library. The, the seminary was expanding, for which we're grateful. In Dr. Campbell's administration, we also added uh, the former Greek Orthodox Church that is now the Mitchell Ministry Center. Um, during the years of Dr. Campbell, uh, Dr. Swindoll's administration, uh, we added um, Swiss Tower. All right? he, his passion was to bring a dissident student body scattered more of a community. And then, as of late, uh, we added uh, Washington Tower. Uh, and this is now uh, our campus, um, born of a passion, born of an idea that the Bible is true and relevant. And you mix those together with sacrifice, enormous sacrifice. And you have Dallas Seminary. Uh, God has been more than gracious to us. I conclude with a poem by Stuart Townen, an English worship leader in Brighton who has authored and co-authored several contemporary songs, some with Keith Getty of Ireland, the one we sang together earlier. I think it is what the seminary is all about. Our vision, our basis, our collective and enduring sacrifice to carry it into our world with passion. You who have joined us this semester, join a band of people now over 80 decades old in the making of our institution. We have vision. We know the Savior. We know the basis that controls and directs that passionate vision. The Word of God. And we are willing to lay aside what others consider valuable because we have fallen in love with the Creator of the universe. 
I ask you to join us. Listen once more to the words that we have sung. They go like this. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. Those wounds which mire the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross. He's it. There's nothing more. God gave us nothing more but his son. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. We have them all. We will not boast of them. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? Why would he call me a son and a daughter? I cannot give an answer. It's not in the Bible. He just did it. No external cause motivates God. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. We love you, our Father. Because you first loved us. And out of your bountiful mercy. Gave us your son. Who walked among us. And was offered up for us. Upon Calvary's tree. And now lives to be with us. We thank you for him. The passion that drives us. Is him. The presupposition we have is that the Bible really does describe him. And it's all we need to be directed to heaven. And our duty, in light of what we have been given, is to lay down our lives each day for him. To love him. To obey him. To care for the things he cared about. To cry out for our people as he cried out for Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. We love you, our Father. We love our school because it's a vehicle to the things we really love. And you have brought it up so that we could use this vehicle to do the things that we are committed to. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.